Hello, everyone. This is Brian Armstrong. Welcome to Coinbase's Around the Block podcast. On today's episode, I'm joined by Anthony Pompliano, an entrepreneur, investor, and podcast host known to many in the crypto world just as Pomp. Our conversation covered a lot of ground from how to think about Bitcoin amid current market conditions to what the merge could mean for Ethereum in the long term. We also discussed the issue of censorship in tech, and we even found time to talk about the names of my cats, believe it or not. <laughs> I hope you enjoy it. But first, I'm gonna chat with my chief of staff, Mark Cialoni, about what's top of mind at Coinbase. I thought we'd kick off with talking about um, like the future potential of crypto given the current macro environment and all of the, the FUD in the markets. Um, so, I mean, in the, the market tur turmoil this year, we've seen most crypto assets trade down significantly along with other risk assets, um, early stage tech companies and such. Um, this seems to have taken this, uh, the wind out of the sails as sort of the narrative around Bitcoin or other crypto assets being an inflation hedge or a store of value. Um, I'm curious what you make of that phenomenon. Uh, and do you see a, a resurgence of crypto coming uh, in this macro environment? Yeah, so typically in down macro environments, we see people, there's a flight to safety, right? And in the traditional economy, that was always gold. Um, there's other commodities, things like that. But I think what we realized in this downturn is that uh, the crypto economy is just a, not a significant enough percentage of the global economy, the broader economy yet, to be actually treated as um, that that digital gold in, in the sense of people fly, you know, go, doing a flight to safety towards Bitcoin. And I think we'll see that probably change over time. I, I could see in the next five or 10 years as crypto, the crypto economy really becomes a, a bigger percentage of the global uh, GDP, that people will actually flee to Bitcoin as the sort of <laughs> the new gold, if you will. Um, but that hasn't happened yet. I think, you know, frankly, I'll, I'll admit, I, I kind of overestimated the uh, the chances that that would be uh, Bitcoin would be this inflation hedge in this kind of macro environment. I thought it may not, might actually draw more attention to Bitcoin in this kind of environment, but it looks like we're a little too early, and it's just such a good reminder that you know even ten years ago when I started Coinbase, I thought I was <laughs> I was like it was super early, but even now today it's it's still super early. Like we're it's going to take decades for the global macro environment to sort of start to think about the crypto economy as the main thing. And we saw something similar happen with um, with e-commerce back 20 years ago, you know, when it first started, 1999, 2000, people treated it as this sideshow. They was like, oh, I'd never put my credit card into a website that it might get stolen or something. And here we are 20 years later and e-commerce is 15, 20% of global GDP. So I think crypto, the crypto economy will follow a similar, similar trajectory. Uh, it just means we probably have another five or 10 years to go. Totally agree. I think um, one interesting phenomenon that's come up um, in, instead of Bitcoin sort of re retaining its value as a flight to stable coins or US denominated crypto assets, um, Coinbase is deeply involved with one of the leading stable coins, USDC, through the center consortium. Um, how do you think about the opportunity for stable coins? What role does it have to play in um, the maturation of the crypto economy? Um, I'm, just, I'm curious how you see it as a, a tool for advancing, you know, the crypto industry and our mission. Yeah, well, you know, looking back, I, you know, I have to admit, early on when I heard about stable coins, my initial thought was, you know, I'm really more excited about decentralized digital currencies. And I still believe that, actually. I think most of the innovation that's happening in this space is going to happen from decentralized digital currencies. But it turned out stable coins were a really important piece along the way that added a lot of important functionality. So, of course, um, you know, it turned out to be important to have stablecoin pairs in uh, in DeFi. Um, it turned out to be useful for people to be able to have stablecoin uh, accounts, basically for people who couldn't have access to, say, the U.S. dollar bank accounts globally, which is a huge percentage of the globe. So, um, look, I think the stablecoin space is going to keep evolving. There are great decentralized stablecoins as well. I think we may see flat coins emerge over time. But for right now, in this moment, uh, we're seeing a lot of interest in stable coins. They've turned out to be a counter cyclical um, source of revenue for a lot of companies out there. And I think that, um, you know, we'll see increasing adoption, especially in the down macro environment of people using USDC more and more in crypto. Basically, we, we're trying to make it easier and easier for people to get their, their funds into USDC. And that's important in this environment as the dollar is kind of strengthening versus other fiat currencies out there in the world. Yeah, it makes sense. You mentioned a new concept that I'm sure a lot of people have not heard uh, called a flat coin. What is a flat coin and why are you excited about them? Oh, yeah. Well, flat coins are um, in basically a relatively new concept. We, we didn't come up with it, but 
it's it's the idea that you want a coin that stays flat relative to purchasing power or CPI. Um, and so, you know, the simple example would be if if you have to spend one coin to buy a McDonald's hamburger today, then five years from now, you it would also be one coin to buy a McDonald's hamburger. And you could imagine a flat coin sort of being backed by um, a set of commodities or, or things that are like kind of raw components that might go into um, the economy. Or there's various ways, you know, you can use oracles to kind of um, try to maintain a, a link with CPI. You have to, it, it's one of these things where you need some kind of connection into the real world potentially, or maybe a DAO type voting structure. But, you know, it, it basically, it's, a, it's an important point, which is that the US, the US dollar is inflating quite a bit this year, right? I think the, the inflation prints we've seen are eight or 9%. So it's not even really that stable, to be honest, right? Like you, you'd ideally probably, I don't know, most people would say you'd want lower inflation than that, like maybe 2% or something like that. So there's an opportunity, I think, out there to actually create a better form of money in the, in the crypto space um, with something like a flat coin. And that's an area that a number of people are, gonna, are working on. I think that's pretty exciting. Zooming back out, uh, I want to talk a little bit more about competition in the industry. Um, I mean, the crypto industry has attracted some of the best and brightest entrepreneurs, technical talent, um, et cetera, over the last few years. Um, and they've built some pretty formidable competition um, across you know, a broad set of products, some that we um, have in market, some that we don't. Um, I'd love to hear how you think about competition because I think it's pretty um, unique uh, in the industry and, and why you believe strong competition is good and particularly why you think it's positive sum and not zero sum. Yeah, well, if you're trying to have a whole industry grow 100x or something like that, it's going to be really important to have lots of good companies in the space, right? And um, that's something that we welcome. Now, competition is also useful in the sense that it makes us better, right? Um, it's just, I think it's one of these things about human nature, which is that uh, if you don't have something that you're competing against, people will tend to compete internally. It's really important, I think, for the team to remember that we're all on the same team internally, and so the competition is external. But and, and you know that can be useful as kind of like a motivation. But I think it's even more important that like every company in crypto sort of thinks about how do we grow the pie 100x. It's really not about um, you know a couple basis points going one way or the other. Like that that's just very zero sum. I think of this space as in its infancy. And so if we grow the whole industry 100x, that's how we're going to ultimately have a much bigger impact on the world. And um, yeah, so I, I have this kind of dual hatted view of a competition. It's good for motivation, but don't don't over focus on it. It's actually better to grow the size of the pie. And, and on the topic of company building, um, we had uh, an offsite with our VPs this last week. And one of the topics that um, we talked about is one of your favorites, which is uh, performance management and building a high performing organization uh, and how important it is to have great people if you want to build great products. Um, I, I'm just curious, how do you think about performance management? Like, what do you think is unique about your perspective? Um, yeah, if you could walk us through. So one of our values at Coinbase is top talent. And I do think it's essential that to make a great, to make great products, you have to have great people and um, everything in the company really comes back to people. And so I, I do think companies kind of, um, can go in different directions on this. You know, some companies are more like a family, um, which is like, you know, once you're in, you're in for life, and we all just try to help each other. Even if someone's struggling, we kind of pick them up and, and pull them along. The other, the other philosophy is really more like a championship team. So on championship teams, you all you, you need to work as a team. You absolutely have to help the people around you, um, and there's a lot of uh, you know development of each other and things like that. But it's a high performing team that really wants to win. And you know, if if you want to have a championship team, the occasionally people who are repeatedly not pulling their weight or they're not raising the average on the team, you know, they get they get cut, they get traded, right? And so that's a little bit of a, a, a tougher or harsher um, thing that people have to grapple with uh, when they figure out what company they want to join. And you know, my observation is, you know, the A players want to work with other A, a players, right? That's kind of like a, a cliche that's out there, but I think it's true. And if you don't actually um, tend the garden, so to speak. You know, you have in, in basically think about every new person who joins. Are they raising the bar, right? Or if some, or if the company has grown, the role has changed, or whatever. There may be someone who at one point was raising the bar, and you know, it's been a, it's been a year or two, or whatever, and they're not in the, they're not as engaged. They're not pulling, they're not raising the bar anymore. And so, I do think it's important, and the top people want to join companies where um, there's rigorous performance management, and we we really need to have a culture where we collect that feedback and make tough decisions. Um, I think that's an important part of building a great company, and it's not like pleasant to think about. 
but it is uh, it is an important part. It's always uncomfortable to talk about individual performance situations, um, but I've always appreciated about Coinbase just being around some of the best and brightest people in the industry. And I hope that um, you know, we, we retain those types of folks and keep that very high bar uh, for many years to come. All right, thanks, Mark. I'm excited to be joined today by Anthony Pompziano, known to many in the crypto world as simply Pomp. Pomp is an entrepreneur and investor who writes the must-read newsletter, The Pomp Letter, and hosts one of the top podcasts about business, finance, and Bitcoin, The Pomp Podcast. Welcome to the show, Pomp. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. Excited to talk. How do you start your shows? You normally do something like you do bang, bang. What is, I forget. What's your catchphrase? How did you come yeah. up with that? <laughs> Uh, I have no clue. I said it one time and uh, as most things, uh, the audience was like, hey, what is that? And I was like, well, I should just start doing that every time. So, uh, <laughs> no master plan ever. All right. Well, I'm new to this. I don't have a catchphrase yet, but maybe we'll find one in the show. Um, all right. So let's see. I guess you wrote not too long ago about Bitcoin. Um, you had this quote, the pro it's the product of more than 40 years of research and development. Um, you know, what do you think people should know about the prehistory of Bitcoin and I guess we're right around the, the 14th bit, uh, anniversary of Bitcoin, the white paper as well. But yeah, what do you think people should know about the history and why did you say that? Yeah, one of the things that uh, most people, when they first learn about Bitcoin, uh, they immediately jump to like the framework that they know, which is, uh, oh, Bitcoin must be MySpace, right? And of course, it's going to get disrupted by the Facebook or, or whatever other uh, thing that comes after it. But when people learn about kind of that 40-year prehistory, uh, it really was a lot of research and development. And, and what's interesting, uh, as you know, is you know everything from TCP IP and kind of just like internet protocols and that type of stuff. But also there's been many, many attempts at digital currencies. And some of them were more successful than others. Ultimately, they all failed uh, for different reasons. Um, but it wasn't just technical breakthroughs either. There was also tons of things like the ethics of liberty and, and kind of these uh, you know seminal pieces that I think pushed forward and eventually get incorporated into uh, what I think people would associate with kind of the Bitcoin ethos. And so when you understand that 40-year history, all of a sudden it's like, oh, maybe this isn't the MySpace. Maybe this is more of like the Facebook or, or the thing that actually disrupted all the other uh, previous attempts. And so, you know, do we know 100%? No, but it definitely gives at least some contextual uh, evidence that uh, this is unlikely to kind of be the, the first thing that is obvious to be disrupted. Makes sense. Yeah, there's certainly like a Lindy effect to these things where just because they've been around for a while is not necessarily a bad thing. Like in, in tech, sometimes you always want the new thing, but in <laughs> infrastructure and in financial services, sometimes you want the thing that's been around a while. So that certainly makes sense. Um, and I, I mean, you said on Twitter recently too that you know Bitcoin remains the only predictable central bank in a world filled with chaos and uncertainty. Um, I mean, we certainly are going through a bit of a economic crisis right now globally. There's a macro recession and everything. I mean, maybe you can say a little bit more. But what do you mean by that? Um, the only predictable central bank. Yeah, this is like an interesting way to look at Bitcoin, right? Obviously, Bitcoin and the white paper talking about kind of electronic cash and and peer-to-peer uh, -peer system, and, and that gets a lot of the headlines. But at the end of the day, if you have a monetary policy that is being dictated uh, by an organization, whether it's centralized, decentralized, a code-based, whatever, uh, it's acting as a central bank. And so what's unique uh, about Bitcoin is that it's programmatic. It, it was written into code. It is not going to be changed. And you can check on a day-to-day -day basis whether it's executing according to that code. But usually, as with many things in life, uh, it only becomes obvious why that is important when the opposite occurs or when there's like a backdrop. And so right now, you know, you and I both wake up every day and we're like, I wonder if the Fed's going to pivot. I wonder if the Fed's going to actually raise interest rates. I wonder what, you know, this other central bank's going to do. Are they going to follow the plan that they set three, six, nine, 12 months ago? Or are they going to change their mind? And if you're in like finance or, or even tech and, and kind of building and, and paying attention to this stuff, uh, you're nimble, you can respond. Usually you've got a team that can kind of help you think through what the ramifications of these changes are. But if you're just like Joe Blow, you know, on the street and you're basically trying to plan your life, it's not very easy to plan around uh, the cost of money changing so often or the value of your currency going up and down. And in the U.S., like, frankly, we've been pretty good about it. Other countries, it's really, really obvious. And so I think just understanding uh, progr a programmable monetary policy and the predictability of it and how important that is, it's just very obvious right now. But I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts, like how you think about uh, Bitcoin and like a central bank, or, or are you more so looking at it you know, as electronic cash or, or, or one of these other uh, ways to describe it? There's such a small number of people with their fingers on the dials uh, at these central banks. And it, they're supposed to be sort of separated from the political apparatus, at least in the US. 
but it's a little unclear like how separate they actually are if you study history. And then in other countries, of course, it's even worse. So it never made sense to me why like the whole world is kind of focused on you know Jerome Powell or what a couple of Federal Reserve governors are going to do. Are they going to change this thing? And it just seems like too much power to be in the hands of such a small group of people for the global economy. So just intuitively, it always made much more sense to me to have something that was truly decentralized that no, you know, everybody had to use a common system and kind of harkens back to what, what used to be the case with gold and, and everything like that. And of course, you know, there's, I've talked to lots of different economists about this and they'll say, well, the goal of the Federal Reserve is to moderate these, uh, these uh, cycles where if you have a big run up or a big down period, and I think in theory, that's a really good idea. But in practice, it's not clear that they're actually moderating those cycles because they are being influenced politically and, you know, they get captured and there's just poor judgment and risk aversion. Like, it's all kinds of reasons. So I think it's a very interesting question. Like, if you basically didn't have people with their fingers on the dials, would you have um, similar volatility to what we have today? Because, you know, you could argue the Fed sort of missed a couple of these signals in the last in the last cycle. Now, put that all aside for a minute. Let's say that you, you say, OK, the Fed is actually doing a better job at moderating volatility, which unclear if that's the case. Still, I would say it still may be better to have um, a decentralized system because you could optimize for basically a higher growth rate um, and tolerate some higher volatility along the way. So that's kind of where I believe things are going as the crypto economy grows as a percentage of global GDP. I think we may see higher volatility. I mean, certainly we are right now. We should we should talk about that just to be kind of intellectually honest. Um, but I think as it grows, it could become certainly higher growth rate and potentially even less volatile just with a de decentralized system. So that's my high level thing. Yeah, you, you mentioned two things that are, are, are quite fascinating. I, I asked on uh, Twitter, or I ran a poll now, a uh, highly biased poll given you know who the audience is. Uh, but I was like, look, at this point, we had uh, intervention almost twice, right? We had kind of intervention on the way up in the macro economy, and now we've had inter intervention on the way down as they've kind of tried to destroy demand. And I asked like, are we now at a point where we can say with uh, any degree of confidence, like, would we have been better off if there had been no intervention? Obviously, during, you know, kind of the, the Q2 of 2020, it was really scary and people were like, oh, my God, we need help. Uh, but was it worth the big run up and then the big crash? Right. Or would we have somehow moderated it with less volatility without the intervention? I don't know the answer. Uh, obviously, the poll results showed like, yeah, they should have stayed out of it biased, but but uh, uh, interesting question, I think, at least to think through. And then when you think of the volatility of crypto assets, uh, and, and Bitcoin probably uh, is uh, a leading indicator a lot of times, uh, but I think the whole market kind of follows generally uh, in, uh, you know, up or down. Uh, Bitcoin's down 70%, which sounds kind of crazy when you think over a 12-month period. But in the last couple of weeks, Bitcoin is the only other currency that seems to be holding up pretty well against a strengthening dollar. And so it goes back to this, you know, kind of uh, debate that economic uh, folks love to have of like, what's the time scale and like, what are you comparing it to? And then you can kind of twist the data to make whatever argument you want, uh, which I think we've always got to just, you know, stay aware of, of like, uh, yeah, you can make this data say a lot of different things and like what actually matters versus what doesn't. Yeah, I think you're really right. And a lot of a lot of where people end up falling on this spectrum comes down to if they they lean more towards like a Keynesian view or, you know, Austrian school and so it eventually, that's one of the things about economics is we don't get to really, it's not a true science. You don't get to run true split tests very often unless it's like, you know, East, West Berlin, North, South Korea. You occasionally get like, history will give you a true split test, but oftentimes it's a, you're debating a counterfactual without even really knowing. So looking back at um, the other big problem with Federal Reserve, of course, is that um, it, the, the dollar is not linked to any hard asset at this point, um, like gold. So the, the, the discipline, the enforcement is not there. Like once the money supply can be inflated, com uh, countries get into these issues where their debt, uh, you know, their debt service becomes too big a percentage of um, their budget. And, you know, it's just repeated over and over again in history. I think this is a huge part of the conversation and people kind of are forgetting about it a little bit of like we have, I don't know, it's like 130 percent or so debt to GDP. Uh, I think globally we're at 400 uh, percent debt to GDP. And so when you have that much debt in a system, uh, two things jump to mind. One is like uh, I always ask all the economists or kind of macro folks who, who I interview, like, could we grow our way out of it? Because we always talk about the debt and like, you know, the debt limit uh, ceiling and like all that type of stuff. But like, could we literally just grow out of it? And the problem is that you would need like 10 or 12 percent annualized growth uh, to be able to really get yourself out of the problem. Uh, and there's no clear path as to like how we would do that. Uh, but the second thing ends up being if you're going to raise interest rates, especially at kind of an accelerated rate, 
there is some tipping point where you can bankrupt your country. Now, I don't think that the United States is going to bankrupt themselves, but uh, historically, the thought process has been you have to raise interest rates higher than the inflation level in order to get inflation to come down. Well, we're sitting with, you know, eight and a half percent, give or take uh, inflation. I don't know if they can raise interest rates that high without putting immense stress on the system, given the debt load that we have. And so you get in this like very complex interrelated world, which like, frankly, like to your point, like we don't know, no one's run the experiment yet. Uh, I don't think we want to be the guinea pigs either, uh, but it's all worth kind of paying attention to because it's obvious the ground beneath us is kind of shifting. And, you know, I think something like Bitcoin is uniquely positioned where it just produces block after block of transactions. And frankly, it doesn't really care what's going on, you know, elsewhere. The younger generation sort of gets this sort of intuitively, but the older generation, when I talk to them, they're about, their thought is often, well, you know, what other currency are people going to go to, right? Like, you know, the Chinese yuan is not even not necessarily in a better position. Their debt ratio is also pretty high. And they're like, the US dollar is it. We're the reserve currency. We have the ability to keep printing. And I always kind of think in the back of my head, have you heard of Bitcoin? <laughs> you know, like there is an alternative that's not the Chinese yuan. And I think a lot of people look at it today and they'd say, yeah, that's a, that's a pipe dream. I mean, we all thought Bitcoin was going to be this new gold standard, but in a down market, you know, it didn't go up. People actually sold it off like a high growth tech stock. So, and I think that's a fair point, but the the ultimate, we're talking about a five year, 10 year trend here. It's not going to happen. Apparently it didn't happen yet today. Do you have any thoughts about when we might see that transition where the, the crypto economy starts to become, or, or Bitcoin becomes that reserve currency instead? Yeah, it, it, it's, um, it's a fair question, I think, and, and it's interesting because in one way, again, if you look at like the 12 month, uh, you know, uh, time scale, uh, it's down a lot, like 70 percent. And people are like, I can't use that money. Like, you know, the U.S. dollar is only down eight and a half percent because of inflation or whatever. Uh, and so that comparison looks bad. But if you look over the uh, entire uh, kind of cycle from, you know, beginning of 2020 until today, Bitcoin's still up, you know, depending on kind of where you start the counting from two to four X. And so it's like this unique thing where the volatility on a day-to-day, week-to-week, or month-to-month basis uh, can be quite extreme. But over multiple years, Bitcoin kind of continues to go up in value. Um, and so one of the questions ends up being, do we need to actually break like a US, deno- uh, US dollar denominated mindset? where people just start thinking of Bitcoin. And, and I joke all the time that like the dollar is pretty volatile, right? Like it probably went down close to double digits, if not double digit percentage in the last 12 months, definitely in the last 24 months. We don't think of that because everything's priced in dollars. We get paid in dollars. You save in dollars, the whole thing. And so Bitcoin, what is actually the volatile component of it is like the exchange price, which I think the deeper and deeper you get into the Bitcoin world, the more you understand, you know, the exchange price is not necessarily Bitcoin itself. The problem is most of the goods and services that you want to consume are priced in dollars. And so you have to convert, right? Or, or you have to think that way. Uh, so I think that's one thing is like if people just switch their mind and start thinking in Bitcoin terms, then obviously the volatility would be uh, uh, not as obvious. Um, but the second thing also is like the people who are holding the asset has drastically changed. And I always use the example of like the internet, right? It was like governments and military first, then it was corporations. And if you wanted to use a computer, you had to like go to the library or go to your company and and you could use the internet there. And then eventually Steve Jobs, Bill Gates and others like put a laptop on everyone's desk uh, in everyone's home and, and everyone got access to the internet. It was this amazing thing. Bitcoin, as you know, and, and literally built, you know, Coinbase from my understanding uh, to kind of help service it was like individuals first. And now we're all excited because like the corporations are showing up and like we've got like one country that's like really leaning in with El Salvador and maybe there will be more in the future or whatever. And so when you have that kind of, uh, you know, individual to nation state adoption cycle, uh, how does that affect this? Like, I don't think we really have that many examples over history, especially of financial assets where that's occurred. Uh, and so we're kind of getting a crash course as that occurs, uh, you know, in, in the last uh, 14 years or so. Totally. Yeah, it's super interesting how, you know, Bitcoin really started off retail, like you said, and then finally we're seeing the adopt, like, you know, Coinbase is doing some of these deals with BlackRock, and we just saw Google now is accepting crypto through Coinbase, Google Cloud is. Um, so we're starting to get the big institutions on board. And my understanding is something like 90% of the wealth and the assets in the world are actually locked up in institutions. It's not in retail households. So yeah, those are the ones we need to kind of go land to get the the next big dollar values moved over into the crypto economy. And look, to be honest, I, I've talked to a bunch of them as, as you know, you, the Coinbase team, and, and many other in in the industry have. Uh, there's a ton of teams at these large organizations that are trying to figure it out. And some of them are, uh, you know, really small teams, but there's somebody who's a Bitcoin or into crypto or whatever, and, and they're working on it. Some of these organizations have hundreds of people on their crypto teams or on their uh, uh, kind of digital assets team or whatever they call it. 
And so like, it's going to happen. I think the question is just like, what is the time frame? And then also organizations like Coinbase and others have to go do the work to actually onboard them, right? Like somebody has to go convince Google Cloud to take the payment and process the payment. And I think sometimes we forget that like this stuff isn't magic. Like someone somewhere builds a piece of technology and goes and actually executes uh, these deals. And, and so the more people we have doing that, I think the better for the industry. Yeah. You're right. A lot of it, I just think it's like moving the ball forward one yard every day. And like you wake up in five, 10 years and like, you know, this thing is 15, 20% of GDP, but global GDP. But anyway, do you think, do you think that's probably like the target and the timeline? Like, you know, call it low double digit GDP uh, kind of ownership. And it happens on like maybe a decade timeline. Um, yeah, like one to two decades. I think so. You know, e-commerce is an example I always love where it's kind of got started around 1999, 2000. And by the year 2020, 20 years later, it was about 15% of global GDP, right? Um, and it, you know, it took seems kind of uh, everything for people like us. We probably buy 90% of stuff online, but <laughs> but in terms of global GDP, it took 20 years to get to 15%. I think I think crypto the crypto economy could follow a very similar path, and it's kind of you know it's it's not starting from zero. It's already been around a little while, but um, yeah, 10 years. I think 15 years we could be at 10, 15% of global GDP. Um, so I guess one other topic I, I just find super interesting is, you know, sort of like we've been talking about when the macro economy came down, crypto came down too. But, you know, Bitcoin was really born in the midst of the last financial crisis in 2008, right? And, you know, I've started to think about that a little bit. I'm curious your thoughts. Like if we started to see banks fail or maybe um, other, you know, countries go through economic crisis and we see some other countries like El Salvador kind of adopt Bitcoin, you know, what's what, under what scenarios might we see Bitcoin break away from the trend and decorrelate uh, with the broader macro environment? And if people get so fed up with what's happening in this economic environment, they're like, all right, it's time for another another plan here. But yeah, what are your thoughts? Yeah, when you think back across Bitcoin's history, and again, you know, kind of the, the earlier you go back, the harder it is to know exactly what was happening. There was less people paying attention and, and all of that. Uh, but in 2008, 2009, uh, there were some people who were looking for alternatives because of the global financial crisis. I, I would wonder what percentage of the people who were interested in Bitcoin at that moment were like, I need an alternative currency because like the legacy banking system is going to fail. I don't know what that percentage was. My guess is it wasn't 100%, right? It, it was some small percentage of people. There was a lot of people who were just interested in the technology. Some people were interested in like the decentralization, whatever. Uh, Cyprus, I think, was like a kind of a, a red pill, an orange pill for a lot of people where uh, I think it was like 2012, 2013, somewhere around there, where the banks, for those that don't know, uh, basically went in and said, hey, we need money. Uh, and they worked with the government and they like taxed every single deposit 10%. They just took the money and said like, that's ours now. Uh, and they uh, had all these capital controls and all that. I think there's a lot of people who weren't in Cyprus who were like, hey, what if they did that in my country? Or, or you know, is this going to become a trend? And so we have, you know, some data points, not a ton of them, but some data points around the world uh, where this has occurred. And I think that uh, to your point about like move the ball kind of one yard every day, uh, each one of these data points just captures the imagination of a couple of people. Sometimes a couple is literally tens of people. Sometimes it may be tens of millions. Uh, but on a global scale, you only need a couple of those to occur in, you know, maybe the first 20 or 30 years of Bitcoin's life before you kind of reach some mass, you know, uh, mind share. And so if you look right now over the last, I don't know, year or two years, the U.S. has been pretty stable uh, from the like economic crisis standpoint. There haven't been banks failing, like that type of stuff. But like there sure has been a lot of unrest in places like Sri Lanka or in Turkey or uh, these other countries. And so my guess is that those countries have seen a pretty big uptick in Bitcoin adoption, including things like Russia's invasion of Ukraine or whatever. Uh, if that was to occur in the U.S. in terms of some sort of economic uh, crisis or bank collapse or whatever, I think that we would be crazy to think we're special, right? And like people wouldn't be like, oh, there's this other option. Like maybe I should just hedge. And even if it's one to three percent or something, like I need to have some exposure to this. But I don't know. What, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think generally when things get bad, people look for alternatives. It's a very simple statement, right? So, um, you, you, you know, you need to have like a hair on fire problem to kind of uh, start to look for what your next best alternative is. And so, in you know, in an up market in the US, people are going to look at things that are really on the cutting edge. They're fun, they're NFTs and DAOs. And hey, can we build the DeFi gaming? Can we build the cool future? You know, in a down market, people start to think about, um, man, where, where can I get a loan? Like, you know, I need to send like a hundred bucks to my family in another country and I don't want to lose $15 on the way. Or, 
Um, they just want maybe like to earn some yield on their assets in a very safe way or, or some, some of the basics kind of become even more important. So I don't know, that's something we're thinking about a little bit is like, how is this downturn of the broader macro environment actually an opportunity for crypto, not just um, a negative thing because it initially put it into a downward, downward trend as well. So I don't think I have the perfect answer yet, but I, I'm thinking about it. Yeah, that's, that's a fascinating way to think about the downtrend actually changes the consumer behavior. The consumer behavior, if you position yourself correctly, could be an opportunity to capture. Uh, I think it's probably a pretty optimistic way to look at, you know, kind of what you can do over the next 12 months or so. I guess, um, you know, just switching gears for a minute, I, I loved the post you put out about tech censorship and, you know, PayPal. That was just bizarre to, to see that. And what do you what do you ascribe that? How How do you think that could have happened inside a company and... You know, they claimed, of course, that it was a mistake, and I, I never want to like, you know, assume bad intent. But I've seen sort of what it worked, what it, what happens inside Coinbase or other companies, just with like one hand doesn't know what the other is doing. And what do you think happened there? I don't know what happened. Uh, I, I think that's kind of like the simple answer. The uh, two data points maybe that that are most interesting. Uh, when I saw it at first, it was almost like that can't be true. Right, was kind of like my initial reaction. Uh, and then I saw enough people talking about it, including people who had worked at the company or, or folks who you know had teams who had went and looked at it and be like, yes, this is real, this is authentic, whatever, that I was like, oh, that's not good. Right. I think it was like the the conclusion of just like forget how it got there. You know, if we go down this path, uh, I think we will regret it. It's a slippery slope. Like we have other examples around the world where this type of stuff happens. And, you know, if not, we should disagree. Like we should be pretty outspoken, I think, as Americans and just saying, like, hey, that's not what we want our country to embrace or kind of be built on top of. Uh, but then the second data point is I wrote this piece and like in the morning when I write, it's just kind of like, okay, there's this current event. Here's my thoughts. You know, I, I put effort into it and, and I try to have like clear, concise thoughts. But at the same time, uh, in some ways I'm writing to solicit feedback as well. Uh, the feedback I got was like, complete extremes. There was people who were like, this is crazy. I deleted my, you know, PayPal account and like, you know, screw these people. And then like the PayPal comms team, uh, there was other people I know who were like sending me messages being like, this was a mistake. How could you write this? Like whatever. And what I realized was like, oh, that's just like a, a sensitive topic. Right. And so like, you're going to get the extreme reactions. And what I took away from it was actually like in the United States, we haven't had to think about this. Right, like like people don't have very well formed views. So like I tend to think like the tech forward folks uh, or people who have paid attention to other countries where some of this stuff happens. Like we've had time to think, internalize, synthesize, and like uh, come to kind of our own personal conclusions as to how we feel about this. Uh, but there's a lot of people in like just the broader society who like they don't ever think about the fact that like a company could uh, kick you out of their bank or could censor your payments or even take money out of your account. And so like that's going to be a fascinating uh, couple of years as like this is probably going to happen more and more, whether it's like really egregious or it's just kind of in this case, they retract it. Uh, but I do think that like this is going to be a topic of conversation. So people should probably start thinking about it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just so important to have financial infrastructure that I think is it's neutral, right? <laughs> and it doesn't get captured by political interests or whatever on one, one way or another. And I can tell you from running, um, you know, a company. Obviously, we have a benefit in the sense we're built on top of Bitcoin and blockchain that are that is truly decentralized. So it's just sort of inherently bakes in some of these properties into our products. You know, if people really don't like what Coinbase is doing, they can move it to another protocol, and we're all interoperable. And like that's part of the ultimate consumer protection of being on a crypto platform. But just speaking with my Coinbase hat on, I I know it's always been a challenge internally because, you know, you you never you build something, you work really hard on every day. You don't want to see something someone use the platform or something you don't love. And sometimes, you know, you disagree with something, but you want to maintain this neutrality. And then you also have partners, you know, no company operates in isolation. So like we want to have our apps in the app store, for instance, right? And the app store has all these rules about what can crypto can and cannot be used for. Whereas we would probably take a more, you know, follow the law type approach um, and not try to be play judge and jury ourselves. but we have to work with bank partners, the app stores. So and it, we put out this blog post a little while back. It was called um, Coinbase's philosophy on account removal and content moderation. And I, I tried to articulate some of our thoughts in there about, you know, how we try to follow essentially um, a First Amendment kind of test, even if it's not necessary for us to follow that. Or globally, the First Amendment doesn't apply. It's a U.S. concept, obviously. But we try to think about that in terms of content moderation, and we sort of treat like infrastructure products different from public-facing products like Coinbase NFT, which you know, might put or like a blog, you know, Medium or Facebook is sort of in that public facing con 
context. Whereas we've even seen infrastructure companies like AWS or Cloudflare do sense, do censor certain apps in certain certain situations. So anyway, I think it's a very it's a really diff difficult topic. And without some kind of clear set of principles, it's easy to sort of get caught up in the moment, get pressured by media, someone in government who they don't think they can get a law passed to do it. So they're going to pressure a company to do it instead. But yeah, I don't know if you have you're saying controversial things like, you know, financial infrastructure should be apolitical. Like that's, you know, in today's society that not everyone agrees with that. Yeah. Uh, but, but I think your your point about like, there is the law and then there's almost this like uh, belief as to um, maybe we should create new laws, but if they can't actually get passed, like let's just use like the online mob, uh, which is kind of interesting. Um, but what I would say is like, it happens on both sides. And, and I, th I think my conclusion as to kind of watching this play out time and again over the last couple of years is that uh, it's more of an information war that gets played out now. And so you see like uh, somebody does something, the mob comes after them. You can see this in, in uh, kind of all the social justice stuff and, and, and things like that. But also you see it like in the PayPal case, like there was a mob that came after PayPal. And now if you agree with the mob, you don't see it that way because you're like, oh yeah, like that, like we're just fighting back. Uh, but it is almost like online mobs versus online mobs now, uh, which is like a weird thing because it loses all nuance of conversation and like the actual point of uh, why people are arguing sometimes gets lost and it becomes more about just like who can dunk on who on the internet. Uh, yeah. So to your point, it's like, is there a framework that everyone can agree on? Like, this is how it should be regulated. Unfortunately, we don't have that yet. Uh, but like, that's what laws are and laws seem to work pretty well. So like, if we want something to be the law, like, let's just create the law that says that. And then that's kind of the rule of the land, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, of course, and the law is itself not perfect. We occasionally get bad laws, like certainly, you know, here in the US occasionally, but it, it, abroad, you can imagine do I really want to follow like the laws of some corrupt regime? And you know, like, no. So it, even when you say like, we follow the law, it's like, there are a lot of countries where following the law would actually be pretty unethical, right? So it's, it's a crazy, crazy thing. Um, okay, cool. Well, just again, shifting gears, I mean, let's talk about the merge and Ethereum. I mean, we're one month out from that. Um, you know, Ethereum became actually deflationary for the first time after the merge, which some people, have started to think about whether that makes Ethereum a better store of wealth, or could it be a bit of that, you know, that gold or whatever the the role that Bitcoin has out there. I don't, I'm not sure if I agree with that, but yeah, you know, what's your view on the on the merge a month out? Yeah, so and most people know, right? Like, I'm not an expert on it. I don't spend a ton of time on it, but I would say that uh, there's probably two or three things that that uh, I find interesting. One is like it happened. Right. For a long time, there's a lot of people who just thought it wasn't going to happen or was going to keep getting delayed or whatever. So, like, I think you've got to be able to separate, like, there was a technical achievement. This is the first main, you know, multi billion dollar uh, protocol that is transitioned from proof of work to proof of stake. And so, like, that occurred. Uh, it seems like that got lost in the conversation. So, like, okay, cool. Check them, uh, check the box on that. Like, that is an important milestone because uh, regardless of whether it turns out positive or negative, and that's where all the controversy is, uh, I think that. Now we're going to run the experiment. Like we are going to find out in this case, like what happened. So, so I think that's one thing. The second thing is, uh, I, I've spent a lot of time um, at dinner recently with with a couple of people who some of these were uh, investors in the presale of ETH. Some of them are very large investors today, and and I've been asking them like, hey, what do you guys expect to happen here? And actually, one of the more popular answers, not all of them, but but one of the more popular answers uh, surprised me. They were like, I think that ETH price will go up over time, right? This is them talking. Uh, but I think it's market share of the smart contract platform kind of ecosystem will go down over time. Mm -hmm. So kind of this belief that like crypto assets in general, Bitcoin all the way to, you know, kind of the long tail will recover and go back up. The question now is just like, where are each one of these individual assets in the grander competition for specific, uh, whether it's narratives or, or, or kind of areas. And so that's interesting because I think most people think it's like, oh, this is either good or bad. This goes up or down. But what happens if actually it's like, no, this is a good thing for the asset and it ends up leading to some sort of price appreciation and the investors are all happy, whatever. But at the same time, you're actually losing kind of ground because it's just increased competition on, on a grander scale. I don't know what's going to happen, but I do think uh, uh, it's a very interesting intellectual exercise to try to understand this stuff. Uh, because if you really think about Bitcoin, for example, Bitcoin has this like disinflationary monetary schedule uh, that people uh, understand and, and are really excited about. And one of the critiques that I've heard a lot of times from the legacy finance people is like a deflationary currency is bad, right? And they basically cite the, the Federal Reserve and like all that stuff. 
like now we have one that is like truly de uh, deflationary. So like, let's see what happens. And I think it'll give both the bulls and the bears firepower to keep arguing on the internet. Um, but it's worth paying attention to. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's, I mean, there's a couple of great topics there. Like one is, is the deflationary currency the right answer? Cause you know, you could, it doesn't really incentivize people to spend it. You want to have some kind of balance there. You could imagine a, a, a currency that comes out that says we have a 2% inflation per year, but it's just hard coded in or whatever, you know, but I, I guess going, I want to make sure I understood something you said about um, the ETH price potentially going up, but the mar smart contract sort of market share going down. So why would the smart contract market share go down in that case? Yeah, so their their argument is basically now you have all of these other blockchains that are competing for a similar use case. So you could have the price of the individual asset go up, but because there's increased competition, even though the market or, or kind of the addressable market is growing, uh, actually your share is going down, right? The equivalent would be like, you know, a, a, a public company stock goes up, but they used to have 50% market share. Now they only have 25 Technically, yes, the investors are making money, but actually on the, the total market size, uh, they're losing market share to other competition or, or, or whatever. And so one of the questions, if you kind of follow that logic, is does market share actually matter? Right. And, and like, I don't know if we know the answer to that yet, only because I don't think we actually even understand how big these markets are. Right. You know, what's the total addressable market of Bitcoin? Some people would argue it's gold. Some people would argue it's the, you know, I don't know, fiat money supply. Some people would argue it's all assets in the entire world. Right. Um, and then you look at like smart contracts. Is that comparable to maybe uh, a sector of publicly traded companies? Is that uh, comparable to the Internet or, or whatever? So like there's a lot more questions than answers right now. Um, I think that's what gets a lot of folks uh, in the tech world or finance world excited about this stuff is like there's a lot to think about. Uh, but at the end of the day, one of the key uh, components that I still believe to be true in, in kind of Bitcoin crypto world is it is more of a free market than the legacy industries. And so you can argue, like, you know, how free is it or, or whatever, but like I tend to be leaning more towards free markets will determine these answers than uh, we want, you know, to your point earlier, like someone with their finger on the scale. Uh, and so, you know, 20 years from now, you and I will look back and be like, oh, we, we know the answer. It's just like, what happens between now and then? I, I have no clue. Yeah. Yeah, well, I agree with you there. I think it's good that there's competition out there amongst blockchains from my point of view. I mean, like from a short-term point of view, you could say, oh, it's confusing to new people who want to come to crypto. There's so many different things to learn. They don't know which one to do. So it does make the user interfaces and all that a little bit like less consistent. But I think ultimately it's beneficial because you need to have competition to sort of eventually get to the right answer. And I don't know, my, my naive take on it is that um, you know, Ethereum had basically number one market share for developers and smart contracts. And that and that's actually a very valuable thing because it means where like a lot of the use cases will get built. Um, they started to see that erode as the, they, you know, they ran into that problem of too much too many people using it. The, the, the fees went up and we saw competitors come on the scene, Solana and others that started to say, hey, we've got this scalability thing solved. Um, they started, ETH started to lose that share. I think it created a little bit of healthy pressure that's like, all right, let's really get these things out. You know, the merge was an incredible technical achievement. My understanding is it hasn't necessarily um, improved the scalability dramatically. And so, but the next ones that they have coming out um, are, are should be doing that with sharding and, and there's all these various things. Um, so it shows they can now do one of these upgrades. That makes it more likely they'll be able to do the subsequent upgrades that actually do get one or two orders of magnitude scalability. And my rough, my rough thought on it is, uh, again, nobody's, everyone's just making this up, <laughs> is that if ETH manages to get the scalability out in some reasonable time frame, I don't know if that's a year or two or what, they'll actually probably retain the number one spot in terms of smart contracts and developed mind share. But if they don't, then it's anybody's ball game who's going to come in and take that. I, and I really do think the scalability can unlock a lot, a lot of new use cases. I, I think that's a completely fair argument. And it feels like uh, uh, a lot of people in crypto uh, whether you've been around for a while or you're brand new, uh, we kind of are like relearning history. We're we're reinventing things sometimes. Uh, so having the the historical context is important to realize that like maybe some of this is exactly how it's supposed to go, uh, and that's actually a sign that like these technologies will be around you know 50 years from now. Yeah, totally. And and of course, as a company, as a CEO, you always want to think about how do we make sure we survive the next technology thing and the next. This is like the innovator's dilemma. Clay Christensen is another good book. Although I found it a little academic, but the, the core principle of it <laughs> is super powerful for that. Because if you hang around in one, it's like, you know, why can't GM beat Tesla? And it's like, if you if your whole company and it becomes risk risk averse and ossified around a certain way of thinking, and then you can't actually leap to the next uh, 
the next technology curve. Okay, so I guess just broadening out from from you know the, the competition happening with blockchains right now, you know, you always talk about like um, down markets are a good time to build, right? And so I'm just curious, like, what are you excited about out there that's being built right now? What do you think um, some of the things might be that kick off in the next cycle for crypto? Yeah, I think that there's um, a whole bunch of different things, uh, but the key things I find the most fascinating uh, are one, infrastructure that previously showed up, it feels like a lot of it was uh, built for uh, kind of those individuals and maybe the start of the corporations. Now what we're seeing is a competition between those like quote unquote incumbent, it's funny to say incumbent in crypto, uh, but like the incumbent crypto firms who are now trying to, how do we serve more uh, corporations? How do we serve the whole financial organizations? How do we kind of even push to the nation state level? So kind of like almost like enterprise infrastructure. Uh, I think that that's a huge thing because now you have startups versus like the crypto incumbent com uh, companies. Plus you get the uh, legacy Googles, Amazons, you know, financial firms, whatever, all competing. So it feels like there's a lot of competition there. The second thing is like stable coins seem to not be slowing down. And uh, I think you're going to get what I'll call private market innovations. So the uh, USDCs, GUSDs, uh, USDTs, what, you know, what, name your kind of favorite stable coin, uh, also in competition with the central bank digital currencies. And, you know, I, I, I've got my gripes with the central bank digital currencies, but like we should recognize that they're going to come. Uh, I was talking to somebody in a financial organization recently, and they literally have somebody at their company who it's the only job is to work with the local government because they know that the central bank is creating a, a, a digital currency and they want to be able to support it or to understand how they need to interact with it for their clients. And I was like, oh, wow, you guys are way ahead of like, most people are still get, you know, wondering, is this going to happen or not? You all are like literally preparing your infrastructure to be able to handle it. And so I think that's like a, a, an area that's going to uh, take a lot of time. And then the third thing ends up just being like, follow the money. And there's a lot of financial firms uh, that are very large, you know, tens of billions, uh, hundreds of billions of dollars of assets who've been kind of sitting on the sidelines and they're like salivating. They're ready to get in the game. Uh, wherever they go, there's going to be an explosion of economic value. Uh, you know, I don't think they're going to go buy like NFTs. I think that it's probably more around trading infrastructure. Maybe it's DeFi. Uh, they're going to buy Bitcoin. They're going to like do some of this stuff. But I do think that almost like flipping it on its head and just saying like, okay, like where is these uh, institutional investors going to put their capital? Uh, and they just have so much of it compared to, you know, right now crypto is like less than a trillion dollar asset class. So when these folks show up, like there's going to be a lot of value created. And as an investor, just positioning yourself to, to capture that uh, would be a pretty good strategy, I think. What do you think? Yeah, well, we're definitely seeing that on the institutional side. I mean, a lot of institutions are still signing up. Uh, they're kind of all waiting on the sidelines. I think they're basically biding their time. Everyone's like, all right, where's the real bottom of this market? And then they're, just, and then they're all going to kind of ape into it, you know, and like start start buying. And so you're saying the institutions are degens, just like they, they like have suits and ties on. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I have a couple areas I think are interesting. I mean, one is decentralized social. Um, obviously, with all the, the censorship and stuff, people are thinking about how do I do this in a way that's open and, and um, lots of people working on that. Um, I think DeFi gaming is potentially interesting. That's that's pretty cool. Um, just getting um, a lot of the basic stuff working better. It's just like, you know, remittance, that's been a big thing for like a long time. And people, people have tried it in various ways. We're trying it in various ways. Um, the other things, I guess two other things I think that could really kick off the next upcycle, we talked about a little bit already. One was scalability of the blockchains, right? Like if ETH lands the surge or one of the next upgrades, um, that could be a really big open, uh, you know, catalyst. And then I think regulatory clarity still. I mean, when I talk to these institutions, just circling back to the beginning of my answer, um, the biggest thing they say is if you get regulatory clarity, they'll they'll move in a big chunk of their portfolio. So there's a couple of bills going through Congress in the U.S. You know, the Stab Now Bozeman bill is, is promising and it's got bipartisan support. So we think it, it'll probably go through next year is our guess. Um, you know, frankly, the... Um, the chilling effect that Gensler's had on the industry in the U.S. is quite frustrating. I think we're seeing some asset issuers in the U.S. Um, basically say they don't want to launch in the U.S. on any kind of U.S. exchange because they, they're afraid of kind of um, the legal burden of the SEC kind of pressure on them, even if they've done the, the legal analysis to believe that they're not a security. So that that's frustrating. I think it's harmful to the U.S. Um, and, you know, but if we can kind of get some of that regulatory clarity, I think that that you know, negative pressure goes away and that would really help the next up cycle as well. Yeah. One, one other thing, as you were talking, uh, that's kind of alongside, uh, scalability and regulatory clarity, things like that is design. 
I think a lot of like Coinbase probably is one of the leading companies and just like you made things intuitive so that people who came from outside of the industry, when they used the product, it was like pretty easy to understand what they were trying to do. Uh, there's plenty of products that are super cool. They do all kinds of, you know, interesting, sexy, shiny things. Uh, but you feel like it's 1990s internet, you know, and you're kind of like trying to like figure it out. Uh, and so I think just more designers and, and kind of better user experiences and things like that also will help uh, because what we're now breaking out of is like the early adopters of this technology and you're getting more into the mainstream and just, you know, they got to know what they're trying to do, right? And and uh, if not, they're going to get frustrated and just give up and, and kind of move on with their day. Totally. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things Coinbase has always tried to do. Sometimes we do it well, sometimes we don't, but we always try to make crypto just easier to use and more trusted, helps the mass market kind of come in and, and use it. Um, okay, cool. So, I mean, we're almost out of time. I just kind of was trying to think of like a good one to end on. If you have other ones you want to talk about too, feel free. But um, I don't know. I think... Um, can, can I ask a question? Can we end on, yeah. a, on an awesome question? I feel yeah. like I know, I know a secret. Uh, you have how many cats? I've got two cats. <laughs> two cats. What are their names? Mochi and Toshi. And obviously and, the, the second one, Toshi, is named after Toshi, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto. <laughs> <laughs> so so Coinbase CEO has a cat named after Satoshi. Uh, I don't think very many people know that. Uh, but but I, I think a great place to end, frankly, uh, every single time that we've ever talked and I've asked like the audience for questions, all this kind of stuff. Uh, and, and I think you and I have joked about it in the past of like, people think Brian doesn't like Bitcoin. And I'm yeah. always like, yeah, I, I kind of feel like uh, Coinbase has done a lot for Bitcoin and helped onboard a ton of people. Maybe just like in closing, like what are your thoughts on Bitcoin? And like kind of how do you think about Coinbase's role in, in accelerating, you know, Bitcoin adoption globally? Yeah. Well, obviously, you know, I've kind of dedicated my life to Bitcoin. So it always kind of uh, scares me when people <laughs> come to this kind of crazy conclusion. But I, I get it. There was a whole history there with the blockchain scaling thing and like the, the Bitcoin scaling wars. And, you know, it's not even worth revisiting at this point. I want the whole industry to kind of collaborate more like the divisiveness, the tribalism in, in crypto is one thing that kind of bugs me. I think it probably bugs you too. And the, the enemy is not other crypto people. Like we're all pretty much on the same team here. Um, the goal is like, how do we hundred X the size of the pie? And, and I think Bitcoin is going to be that digital gold. It may even become the payment layer. Like I'm, I'm pro lightning network, like all this stuff. Um, but I'm also like supportive of everybody in crypto who's basically trying to create decentralized cryptocurrencies that, increase economic freedom in the world. So the tribalism doesn't help. I think actually competition is good. It creates um, pressure, like healthy pressure uh, for there to be more innovation. And it's kind of like, you know, Windows used to have a monopoly and that created all this bad behavior. Now we have on, on mobile, we have Android and iOS. That's not like a huge competitive market, but at least there's two of them. And that benefited consumers enormously, right? To have at least some kind of option because Frankly, Apple has not been that friendly to crypto. And, you know, now we have uh, on Android, we have like people actually approving the apps and allowing the functionality, whereas the Apple App Store doesn't sometimes. It's probably a bunch of antitrust issues with that, by the way, which we'll leave for another day. But um, in crypto, it's good. We have multiple people working on different blockchains, different tokens. And um, so anyway, I love Bitcoin. Hopefully that put that one to rest. And I even named my cat after Stoji Nakamoto. <laughs> So I I mean, I've benefited enormously from that research paper that came out. Obviously, I, I built a whole company on it. And now, you know, we've got over 100 million verified users. I, I'd like to think we've helped more people get their first Bitcoin than any other company in the whole world. So, um, yeah, that's my thoughts. A hundred million people is uh, is no small number. And every time I think that I hear a Coinbase number, it, it uh, continues to increase. So uh, I appreciate all the hard work you guys are doing. And uh, thanks so much for having me. Yeah. Thanks for the chat. This was great, Pomp. Thanks for everything you do for the community as well. This has been the Around the Block podcast. Thank you so much for listening. We'll be back in two weeks. In the meantime, you can subscribe to this podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. See you next time. Today's conversation is for informational purposes only and does not constitute legal or investment advice. Actual results may vary materially from any forward-looking statements made and are subject to risks and uncertainties.